Well, hello everyone. My name is Professor Brian Mangum, and I want to welcome you to this, the first lecture entitled Introduction to NCD Epidemiology in the Certificate of Professional Practice in the Epidemiology and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases. So if you're watching this video, I can only assume that you've signed up with me for this Certificate of Professional Practice, and I'm thrilled to have you with us. Most of you will be located across the United States-affiliated Pacific Islands, and so that will include places like CNMI, Guam, Palau, the Marshall Islands, and then the states of the Federated States of Micronesia. And then we might also have some participants from the Southern Hemisphere as well, from Kiribati, the Solomon Islands, and so on and so forth. But if you're watching this, what it means is you are dedicated to the practice of public health, uh, you're dedicated to the practice of medicine, you're dedicated to the practice of whatever happens to be your discipline that's associated with epidemiology and the control of non-communicable diseases here in the Pacific Rim, and I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled that you've decided to take time out of your busy schedules to uh, engage in this professional development activity, and I hope that it's worth your while. Uh, like we've talked about before in some of my other lectures, and you know already, we're drowning in non-communicable diseases out here in the Pacific, and one of the many tools that we have, one of the solutions that we have, would be better epidemiology, better data collection analysis, and then using that data to uh, develop evidence-based programs. So welcome aboard, and congratulations to you for making the decision to improve yourself professionally. Now, many of you know me already. For those who you don't uh, or haven't met me in person, my name is Professor Brian P. Mangum. And I'm a consultant epidemiologist, but in particular, I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Fiji National University, and that's within the School of Public Health and Primary Care of the College of Medicine, Nursing, and Health Sciences. I am also, for the next uh, three years or so, I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology and public health in the public health training program at the College of Micronesia, FSM, located here in Pompeii at their national campus. And the reason I am here in the, uh, the COM okay, and the FSM and across the USAPI is because of the Pacific Island Health Officers Association and the University of Arizona Zuckerman School of Public Health. They were able to secure a grant to provide trainings like this across the region. So we're extremely thankful for that. We're very uh, fortunate that we were able to secure those funds and we're thankful to our partners for uh, continuing to support us in these efforts. Okay. Well, like I said... Um, as like I mentioned before, I'm excited to be providing this course. Uh, there really is a need for better epidemiological methods across the region, as you know, to handle what is essentially a growing NCD pandemic. Uh, just a little bit about me and, and how I ended up here in the Pacific working in NCD is I actually work a lot in infectious diseases like leptospirosis and, and dengue and things like and chikungunya as well, but I also work in NCDs. Uh, but I'm originally from the United States. I'm originally from Idaho, a small town called Blackfoot. Uh, uh, nowhere near the ocean, which is perhaps why I had such a desire to come out here to the Pacific. But I actually have spent my professional life just not here in the Pacific, but in the Caribbean, Latin America, Africa, and I spent a huge chunk of it on islands. And so I consider myself sort of an island person. I tend to be a little bit more laid back and relaxed, just like all of you. And in fact, I'm married to my lovely wife, uh, Professor Tammy Mangum, who is also originally from Idaho, but she is down holding down the fort in Fiji, where she is an assistant professor and a department chair at Fiji National University. And I have four kids that uh, range in age from my oldest boy is 14 down to my youngest is uh, is just going to turn five this year. And really all they've known are islands. I don't think they could handle life on the mainland. But anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I consider myself a part of the Pacific and I'm, I'm hoping to make this my home for a long period of time and to be involved in efforts like this ongoing. Well, enough about me. What about this uh, series of lectures, and in particular this lecture? Well, this video lecture is going to take you about an hour to complete, okay? And it's going to provide you with an overview of the discipline of epide epidemiology with an emphasis on non-communicable diseases. Now, after you complete this video lecture, there's going to be a series of learning questions as well as some instructions on how to document your participation, all of which goes towards earning you that certificate of professional practice in the epidemiology and control of non-communicable diseases.
And really quick, I want to mention my special thanks to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for this open source material upon which I base these lectures. Now, I've adapted them for the Pacific context, but much of the material originally came from open source uh, lectures that were provided by the CDC. So having said as much, why don't we just jump in and get started. So what are our learning objectives? Well, at the end of this training, I'm hoping that participants will be able to describe how to use epidemiology to address public health problems. And in particular, we're hoping that you'll be able to use it to address uh, uh, epidemiological problems as they relate to non-communicable diseases. And we ha do have a couple of uh, very specific things that we're hoping you're going to be able to demonstrate. Okay. We hope that you're going to be able to demonstrate mastery of some basic uh, terminology as it relates to epidemiology as well as non-communicable diseases. We'll do some brief uh, discussions. I don't have specific slides about it, but we'll briefly discuss uh, communicable versus uh, non-communicable diseases. You know, here in the Pacific, we have a double burden of disease. We're still fighting the communicable diseases like dengue and also the introduction of new communicable diseases into the region like Zika virus. By the way, I have a... Um, uh, lecture if you'll go to my YouTube page about Zika virus and what public health practitioners need to know in the Pacific. But we're fighting this double burden. We've got communicable diseases as well as non-communicable diseases. And so really the tools that you learn in an NCD epidemiology class are applicable to communicable disease epidemiology as well. Let's see, we're also going to hope that you can use basic definitions of epidemiological terms and that you can discuss the core functions of epidemiology. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. And in particular, I want you to take away a new appreciation for epidemiology as the science behind all of public health activities and hence its critical importance in the uh, control and prevention of non-communicable diseases. So we're going to begin this first lecture by defining non-communicable disease. So for the purpose of not only this video lecture, but throughout this entire Certificate of Professional Practice, um, we're going to use the term chronic disease, all right? We're not going to, excuse me, we're not going to use the term chronic disease as they were known in the past, but we're actually going to use the terminology non-communicable diseases or NCDs, okay? So let's start out by defining that. Um, we define NCDs as those diseases of a long duration, okay, that have a slow progression and which tend to not be passed from person to person, so they're not communicable disease. Okay, um, So that right brings up a couple of different questions. So the first thing we need to ask is, well, what about like things like HIV? What about injuries? What about dengue or even malaria that are also going to be a problem here in the Pacific Islands? Now, these can be diseases of long duration, particularly HIV, which, as you know, is, is really a lifelong disease if properly managed, with most of our HIV patients actually dying either from pneumonia or one of the uh, uh, tuberculosis diseases in most instances, but they're not actually going to be considered NCDs because they are not spread from person to person. So that's one of the key differences I want you to keep in mind. And you inherently know this already, but do keep in mind that's one of the differences between the communicable versus the non-communicable diseases. And like I said, we're going to use NCDs as opposed to chronic diseases in this particular class. So NCDs are characterized by not resulting from an infectious process, okay? And as such, they're not going to be communicable from person to person, okay? They do cause morbidity and they do cause dysfunction that reduces the quality of life of our patients, okay? And they do tend to also reduce the duration of the life of our patients, okay? And they usually develop over long periods of time. They have what we call an insidious onset. And when I say they have an insidious onset, that means it's usually a slow, unnoticed thing. So hypertension would be a wonderful example of this because if you think of hypertension, most of your hypertensive patients don't know they're hypertensive because there's not really no outward signs and symptoms of that. Okay. And then the other thing we need to remember about our non-communicable diseases is that they result in a protracted period of poor health towards the end of the lifespan of the individual. Now, some infectious diseases, I do want to point out, like ulcers as well as cervical cancer, actually can have an infectious origin as well. So do keep that in mind that some of our non-communicable diseases can actually come from communicable sources. <laughs> 
Now, I do want to mention that there's some variety of opinion about this definition of NCDs that we're using, so it's important to be a little bit flexible. So just as an example of this, some agencies actually will classify HIV as a chronic condition. Okay. However, using our definition it relates as it relates to infectivity, then HIV would not be a chronic condition, nor would we classify it uh, in, under our strict definition of NCDs. So this is why the term NCD is important in its usage, as it conveys the fact that NCDs are non-communicable. Now we can also include some other diseases in our definition, or what I like to refer to as the forgotten NCDs, and these include chronic mental illness as well as injuries. Now as you probably know, many forms of mental illness such as uh, rapid cycling bipolar as well as some of the different subtypes of schizophrenia are going to have a rapid onset. Now our definition of NCDs says it has an insidious onset, but we would still include these forms of mental illness as they have a as they're protracted in their course, they're very difficult to treat, and they result in significant social and other forms of impairment that impact society from both an economic as well as a social standpoint. So we also include injury, even though it does have a rapid onset, as, as um, injuries result in prolonged convalescence, as well as impaired function that once a man uh, creates a burden that has to be borne by society in terms of economic as well as social costs. So what are some examples of non-communicable diseases? Well, we could probably easily list a lot of them, and there's some examples there on the screen, and this would include things like cardiovascular disease. Now, when I say cardiovascular disease, I'm including in that um, coronary heart disease, heart attacks, um, stroke, as well as things like peripheral vascular disease as well. We could also include in our list things like cancers, okay, because a lot of cancers uh, have lifestyle-associated onsets that make them NCDs. And we could also talk about chronic lung diseases like COPDs. Type 2 diabetes, of course, would come into this category as well, as well as some of our chronic neurological conditions like dementia, um, senile dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on and so forth. And of course, we would also want to include arthritis as well as some of the uh, other musculoskeletal diseases. Now, like I mentioned already, here in the Pacific, we suffer under the burden of all of these, okay? And given that the first four in the list, in other words, cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and diabetes are actually the top causes of morbidity and mortality in the world, it's probably not surprising to you who are already working in medicine and nursing and laboratory science and public health to learn that they are also going to be the top causes of morbidity and mortality here in the Pacific. Now, tragically, what we know is that we've become one of the most, well, in fact, we actually have become the most obese region and one of the sickest regions in the world. And like I said, the tragedy about all of that is that we're laboring under this double burden. We now have the highest rates of uh, non-communicable diseases, and we continue to labor under very high rates of communicable diseases. So all of this is more reason to place an emphasis on learning and applying epidemiological methods, specifically to NCDs, but also these methods can be applied to communicable communicable disease as well. So here we see a list of the leading causes of attributable global mortality and burden of disease. And it's kind of old, it's from 2004, but it, it, I'm using it to illustrate a specific point here. And that point is that most lists of the causes of death show the disease that led to the to the death, okay. But here on this list, we see a list. We see a listing that takes one step back and actually looks at the cause of the disease. And in particular, it looks at preventable risk factors that often result in the death. Okay. So on the left, what you see is the con the contribution of each risk factor to overall mortality, and then on the right, you see the contribution of each risk factor to what we call disability adjusted life years lost. Okay. Now D A L Y S dailies. Okay, is simply a measurement of the number of years of good health. Okay, and when we say good health, we're talking about productive health in which a person is actively contributing to society. Okay. So dailies is simply a measurement of the number of years of good health that are lost to things like bad health or disease states, as well as disability and ultimately death. And so why is this important? Well, this is important because we need to understand that when we're talking about NCD epidemiology, okay, we're talking about it from a public health standpoint. 
So in other words, it's good from a clinical standpoint if we get people to control their hypertension through like an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic and things like that. But from a public health standpoint, particularly when it comes to um, disability, uh, the dailies, that we're talking about here. When it comes to the dailies, we need to understand what the risk factor is for the underlying cause of the high blood pressure. Now, a lot, as you know, a lot of the cases of hypertension are primary hypertension, and we don't necessarily know their causation, but we do know that there is an association with things like high blood pressure and tobacco use, high blood pressure and obesity, and those in turn lead to a discussion about why are people obese? What are the underlying risk factors related to economics and lifestyle choice that once we develop an understanding of those those things from the standpoint of NCD epidemiology, and in particular what we would call social epidemiology, how can we control obesity by controlling its underlying root causes? And that's one of the reasons that it's so important that we develop an understanding of epidemiology in both our public health as well as our clinical practice. So what are some common characteristics of these NCDs that we're talking about? And we've mentioned a couple of these already, but I want to go just a little bit more in depth. Here are some examples of the characteristics of NCDs. They have very complex ideology. In other words, the underlying reasons that people get NCDs are not, simple, are not very simple. All right. It isn't enough to simply look at a hypertensive patient or a patient with type 2 diabetes and go, you're fat, you eat too much sugar, you need to lose weight. It's much more complex than that. We have to look at the socioeconomic conditions the patient comes from. Do they have sufficient levels of education that they can work so that they have a job where they can afford fresh, fr fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy sources of protein in their diet? Do they have sufficient educational level that they understand health literacy so that they can be educated about risk factors? And even if they understand all these things, do they live in an environment where they are politically and economically and educationally able to make better choices about their environment and the uh, behavioral risk factors that they sometimes engage in? So our NCDs are extremely complex, okay? Um, I'm going to make a suggestion to you regarding this really quick. Um, for a really good in-depth discussion about how economics and behavior are interrelated as they uh, relate to NCDs, I have a lecture on my YouTube page and it's entitled Economic and Nutritional Shifting Roots of the Global NCD Pandemic. If you will go to my YouTube page, you can watch that and I would be happy to provide you with a certificate of professional development associated with that lecture. But it goes much more in depth about the complexities of where NCDs come from and how oftentimes they're related to transnational and global factors that are well beyond the control of our patients and sometimes even well beyond the control of the governments that are trying to prevent NCDs. So I do encourage you to go out and watch that. So in addition to having very complex ideology, and you know, you know, obesity was one of them, but we could also look at diabetes as an example of that. Think about diabetes. Diabetes essentially, uh, when we're talking about type 2 diabetes here, is essentially a combination of genetics plus lifestyle, which once again is related to those social and economic factors such as income, access to food, access to primary care, and so on and so forth. Okay, So they have a very complex ideology. They also have very complex complex risk factors that are oftentimes associated with the etiology. Another example of this might be cardiovascular disease, which can be caused by a combination of lifestyle choices, but there's also a genetic factor at play. And once again, it's a very complex intertwining of socioeconomic as well as medical factors that we're dealing with here. The other thing we know that characterizes NCDs is that they have very long latency periods, meaning that they have a long history between the onset and eventual death or disability. And oftentimes it's difficult to determine how long the latency period has been, and hypertension is a wonderful example of that because a lot of our patients have been hypertensive for years, but because they, don't, they haven't been accessing the healthcare system, they haven't been diagnosed, and because they haven't been showing signs and symptoms, they haven't made any form of self-diagnosis as well. Same thing with type 2 diabetes. You, you who are our healthcare providers in the audience know full well that oftentimes people show up when they have full-blown diabetes. They don't show up when they're simply insulin resistant. Okay, So they do have a long latency period and it's oftentimes um, difficult to determine how long the, the disease has been present. They are non-communicable, so we've talked about that already, and they cause prolonged illness. Okay, 
And then the other thing that we need to mention is that they impair function and they can actually result in disability, okay, such as a stroke or an amputation that impairs the ability of the individual to take care of themselves across the lifespan or to care for their family. Um, recently participated in a wonderful study with WHO where we looked at NCD-related disability in seven island countries in the Southern Pacific. And what we found was that the disabilities that we see, the stroke, the diabetic retinopathy, uh, the blindness, the amputation, and so on and so forth in these countries had a high association with NCDs and at the same time these countries didn't have the ability to uh, take care of the rehabilitation needs of these new populations of disabled people so it placed a huge economic and social burden on these island countries. And of course, they have this insidious onset that we talked about, and they can't be cured. Okay, So I do want to mention, though, because um, it kind of paints this grim picture already, although the NCDs may be incurable, all right, once you're diabetic, you're diabetic, we do know that with good public health research and good medical research that we can actually learn methods to enhance the management of these diseases and hence improve the quality of life of individuals before they become uh, overduly impacted and before we move into a situation where we're no longer talking about secondary prevention but we're actually talking about tertiary prevention. Okay. So next we need to talk about this concept of risk factors because we constantly talk about, well, this population is at risk for hypertension or this population is at risk for cancer or this population is at risk for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So NCDs are based in risk factors. Okay? Uh, risk factors are sometimes seen as lifestyle-based decisions made by at-risk populations. Okay? So we really need to have a good working definition of what we call a risk factor. And as you can see there on the screen, we can simply define risk factors as an aspect of personal behavior or lifestyle, an environmental exposure, or a hereditary characteristic that is associated with an increased risk in the occurrence of a particular disease, injury, or condition. So the first thing I want you to notice is that it does start out with this idea of personal behavior and lifestyle, and that is a huge element in terms of many of our non-communicable diseases. But it also mentions things like environmental exposure and hereditary um, uh, characteristics, okay, and oftentimes environment and hereditary are simply things that are beyond the control of the individual. So that's something to keep in mind when we're dealing with non-communicable diseases from a public health standpoint, is that we can uh, control many of the risk factors, okay, and, and we'll call those modifiable risk factors, and we'll talk about that in a minute, as related to things like behavioral choices, but many risk factors we simply cannot control. Okay, because as you know, and from your previous studies, when it comes to a disease state, it really is a matter of genetics plus environment in many, many instances. And we'll talk about that just a little bit later as we go on. Um, I do want to mention and just ask the question, what is an environmental exposure? Okay, well, this would be things like exposure to the sun for individuals that work outside in a, you know, a farmer or some type of an occupation in the outdoors. And because they work outdoors and because they work in an environment where they're exposed to solar radiation, they would have what? They would have a greater risk factor for developing skin cancer, uh, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and of course, malignant melanoma. Another example of this would be someone who lives in a home with a tobacco user. And because they live in the home with a tobacco user, they're at increased risk for second and third hand smoke exposure that can lead to lung cancer. And I do want to mention it's important to recognize that risk factors can either be modifiable or non-modifiable in nature. Okay, And we're going to talk about the differences of that in the next couple of slides. So can you define a modifiable risk factor? Okay, well, yeah, we can define that. And it simply means a factor that can be reduced or controlled through a public health intervention. Okay, and that public health intervention can lead to personal responsibility and personal changes in lifestyle or behavioral actions on the part of an individual that represents an at-risk population. Now, the results of such a reduction or intervention is that the probability of the disease occurring is lowered. 
Okay, and that's good for both a public health or a population-based medicine approach as well as a clinical medicine approach. And because we've lowered the probability of the disease occurring, we have hence reduced the risk of morbidity and mortality associated with that potential disease. And in the long run, what we've done is we've actually saved society both an economic as well as a social burden from an individual suffering from an NCD. Now, WHO has categorized four priority risk factors that can actually be modified or changed as a means of reducing the burden of NCDs worldwide. And this includes increasing physical activity, decreasing tobacco use, decreasing alcohol use, and changes in the diet and the caloric intake away from high fat and processed carbohydrates to diets that feature low fat and are high in fruits and vegetables as well as good sources of protein such as the uh, fish that we can catch here in the Pacific as well as lean chickens as well. Now it's important to keep in mind that modifiable risk factors that reduce the risk of one disease are oftentimes going to reduce the risk of multiple disease. And essentially what we get is a more bang for your buck type approach here. Um, obesity is a fabulous example of this. By reducing obesity, what do we do? We reduce the risk. Uh, we've reduced the risk of type two di type two diabetes. We reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, and we actually reduce the risk of several forms of cancer, including breast cancer as well as prostate cancer, all of which are a problem here in the Pacific. Now, for more information on the control of obesity among adults as well as children from what I call a public health standpoint or a community-based standpoint, I want you to go over to my YouTube page, and there's two different lectures you can watch there. One is entitled Obesity Prevention and Control, the Healthy Communities Approach, and the other is entitled Childhood Obesity Prevention Programs, Comparative Effectiveness of Interventions. And same thing again, if you'll go watch those and contact me via email, I can provide you an individual certificate of professional development, but they're good because they talk about obesity control. And obesity is a wonderful example of how modifying one risk factor changes the whole dynamic for other diseases in the population. Now I also have one that deals with type 2 diabetes that I'd like you to go watch as well, and it's entitled Type 2 Diabetes and Public Health, Correlates and Prevention. So you can go look for that as well. So we've talked about modifiable risk factors, so now let's talk about non-modifiable risk factors. And I mentioned these briefly, but let's just go a little bit more in depth now. So, what is a non-modifiable risk factor? Well, simply put, a risk factor that cannot be reduced or controlled through a public health or medical intervention. So, examples of this would be things like age. You can't change your age. Gender, okay? It's difficult to change your gender. You can't change your ethnicity, and you really can't change your genetics that you were born with. That's the lot that you were handed in life. So, these are all risk factors that cannot be modified. So, let's think about breast cancer as an example example here. If you have a genetic history of a close relative, a mother, a sister, an auntie, something like that that had breast cancer, and you happen to be a female, now males can get breast cancer, but it's at lower rates at females, and you come from certain ethnic groups, so for example on the mainland that would be like African American descent, okay, then these are going to be non-modifiable risk factors for breast cancer that cannot be controlled or altered by individuals that fit within the paradigm of that at-risk population. Now, however, in terms of pathophysiology, I want you to keep in mind that disease is generally a combination of genetics plus environment. So the woman who has the risk factors that we mentioned above, but who chooses to eat a healthy diet and to exercise and to make good lifestyle choices, actually can reduce the risk that the non-modifiable -modifi risk factors in the disease will actually contribute to the development of breast cancer. So even though it's a combination, even though we have these non-modifiable risk factors that we can't change, we do need to keep in mind that it is oftentimes, once again, it's that combination of genetics plus environment that results in disease. Environment can oftentimes be altered. So what we're going to do in the next couple of slides is we're going to go ahead and we're going to define epidemiology and we're going to discuss different epidemiological approaches including descriptive and analytical epidemiology and we'll use some examples of that and then we'll talk about how epidemiology or what I sometimes call population-based medicine differs from clinical medicine in its approach and its implications for non-communicable disease rates.
So obviously we start with the question, what is epidemiology? Well, is it epidemics and disease control? Is it emergency management? You know, is it man in yellow biohazard spacesuits in a laboratory that are studying Ebola? Is it the application of biostatistics to answer questions? Well, it really is all those things and quite a few things more. So here's a couple of key points that I want to bring up. Um, epidemiology is the basic science behind public health, as well as much of clinical medicine in terms of the application of drugs and procedures to evidence-based patient care. It is also the study of disease at the population level, hence the term we sometimes use of population-based medicine. It answers the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why, and the how of health and disease in a specific population. And it's also going to be the application of data and research to improve public health and to prevent disease and disability in the populations that you and I serve across the Pacific. So here is the U.S. Um, CDC uh, definition of epidemiology, and you can read it there. So it says epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states in specified populations and the application of this study to the control of health problems. Clear enough? Well, perhaps not, particularly if you're new to the field of epidemiology. So what I'd like to do is discuss some of the terms that you see in that definition there, including distribution, determinants, health-related states, specified populations, and application. And we're going to do that one by one in our next couple of slides. And in so doing, we're going to give you some examples, and hopefully the definition will become a little more clear. So the first term from our definition of epidemiology from the good folks over at the CDC is distribution. So what is meant by distribution? Well, distribution is the occurrence of a disease as categorized by person, place, and time. Now, when I say person, place, and time, this is what we call descriptive epidemiology or the descriptive epidemiological triad. Okay? I want you to keep that in mind because it's going to come back a little bit later in the lecture. So here we have an example of distribution. Okay, So according to a study of deaths in country X in 2008, 1,034 cer uh, cervical cancer deaths occurred among women between the ages of 45 to 54. So this example provides a time period of 2008, the place is country X, and the persons affected are women aged 45 to 54. So the distribution is simply the person, place, and time of a disease rate as, as shown in a population. So now we need to understand what determinants are. Okay, so what's meant by a determinant? Well, determinants are all the causes and the risk factors for the occurrence of a disease, including the physical, biological, cultural, social, and behavioral factors. So once again, you can see that when we're dealing with NCDs, it's, it's very complex. You know, there are biological factors at work, there are cultural factors at work, and there are also behavioral factors that go into the, the presence of an NCD in the population. So here we have an example of determinants. So smoking was a risk factor or determinant for the greater number of cancer deaths among women ages 45 to 54 in country X. Now determinants are the how and the why for the cancer deaths in country X, including things like poor nutrition, tobacco use, lack of access to health education, general lack of health literacy in the population, and other factors such as socioeconomic conditions that increase the risk of someone engaged in an unhealthy behavior that might lead to cancer. Okay? Or in other words, being exposed to disease-causing agents such as pollution, radiation, tobacco smoke, and so on and so forth. So once again, a determinant is simply the underlying causes of the disease. So we've answered the question of what is distribution. We've answered the question of what are determinants. So now we have to answer the question, how do we define health-related states? Well, a health-related state generally refers to a pathological process or a disease okay, being present in an individual or a population. So in other words, a diagnosis of specific disease or the identification of a specific cause of death if our patient happens to have passed away. Now, both are very important states in terms of disease surveillance and determining the extent of a disease burden in a population. But it also can relate to a specific behavior, such as being a cigarette smoker, engaging in a risky sexual behavior, excessive consumption of alcohol, and so on and so forth. 
So here we have another example. According to the 2008 study in Country X, 1,034 cervical cancer deaths occurred among women between the ages of 45 to 54. So here we can see that the health-related state is the cervical cancer deaths in this specific population. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to define a specified population. Now a specified population refers to a measurable group or a cohort if you will that is designed defined by something. Okay, It can be defined by time, it can be defined by demographics such as age, gender, geographic location, uh, neighborhood, state, island, um, it can be something like educational status, it can be income and so on and so forth. Okay, Or it can be some other type of characteristic but the point is we have some type of characteristic that joins the individuals in that group together and hence gives us a specified population. So here we have another example. Women aged 45 to 54 living in a rural village in country X from 2001 to 2009. Okay, So the specified population are going to be women aged 45 to 54 living in a rural village. So we have a population and we have the specifics which define the population. So in other words, these are female, rural village, aged 45 to 54. All of that is demographic characteristics of the specific population that we're actually studying. So now that we've defined a specified population, the next term we need to look at is application. So how do we define application? So application be de can be defined as the analysis, conclusion, distribution, and timely use of epidemiological information to the health of a population. So let's give an example of this, and you can see it up on there on the screen as well. As a result of the Country X study, Free cervical cancer screening programs were implemented. They targeted women living in remote areas in hopes of finding women with cervical cancer at an earlier stage in order to prevent death. So here we see the application of the study findings. It was determined that women living in rural areas had less access to screening and hence higher rates of cervical cancer, hence the need for better screening in rural areas to identify at-risk women when they could still be treated through things like colposcopy and so forth to reduce the mortality burden of cervical disease in that particular population. So application is simply can we take what we've learned and can we apply it to the prevention of disease in the population. Okay, so now we have defined epidemiology. Okay, so now that we understand what epidemiology is, we turn to the question of why epidemiology? Why is it that we're actually going to do epidemiology? Okay, in other words, what's the purpose of epi? Well, the purpose of epidemiology is to measure the frequency of disease in the population. So in other words, we want to count it, we want to quantify it, we want to know how much is out there. It's also to assess the distribution of the disease. In other words, who is getting it, where is it coming from, and when, where is the disease, and when is the disease occurring. So once we have this information, what we can do is we can actually form a hypothesis about the causes of the disease, and hence how to prevent the disease from occurring. So this is going to require that we identify determinants of the disease, and then we can test those determinants through our hypothesis. Now, I want to mention here that we need to differentiate two terms. Okay, We need to differentiate risk factor versus determinant, because sometimes we use them interchangeably. Now, a risk factor is something that increases the risk of getting a disease. Okay, So examples of risk factors would be cigarette smoking, okay, age, gender, bad diet, and so forth. Okay. Now, a determinant, on the other hand, is going to be a personal, a social, an economic, or an environmental factor, which determines the health status of a population. So, returning to our example of cervical cancer in country X, a risk factor for high rates of cervical cancer would be multiple sexual partners, but a determinant of the risk factor would be living in poverty where a female is forced to become a commercial sex worker in order to provide for her family, thus increasing her risk factor for cervical cancer. So risk factors and determinants are connected, but they are different. Well, you got to understand something about epidemiology. It's based on assumptions. 
Okay, and the first assumption is that diseases and other health-related events aren't random. Okay, they don't just happen in a population. There are connections between risk factors and determinants that we in public health can alter. And if we can alter those, then the rates of a disease and a disability in a population tends to go down. So that's our first assumption. The second assumption is that the disease and other health-related event events usually have factors associated with prevention that can be identified. And if we can associate a risk factor with a preventative factor, then once again, we can control the rates of disease in the population. So again, if we return to our example of cervical cancer in country X, if a risk factor is multiple sexual partners and a determinant is socioeconomic status resulting in commercial sex work, then we can state that the occurrence of cervical cancer among commercial sex, work sex workers living in poverty is not random, all right? It didn't just happen. There is an association there. As such, we can intervene to alter these risk factors, such as providing educational and other programs so that women will not have to engage in commercial sex, worker, sex work to make a living. Or that we can demand that these commercial sex, work, sex workers can demand the use of prophylactic devices to reduce their exposure and their risk factors for cervical cancer and other STIs. Well, cervical cancer isn't an STI. I apologize. Okay, now we also need to understand that we do not know all the causes of the risk factors for non-communicable diseases, but we do know many of them. And fortunately, some of these factors, such as tobacco use or elevated cholesterol, can be avoided and modified in order to lower the risk of the disease in the population, while other risk factors require complex social, economic, and political interventions to lower their risk factors. Now, coordination between epidemiologists and clinical providers is absolutely essential. Since for an epidemiologist to compile, compile population data or epidemiological data, individual clinical data is oftentimes going to be needed. This is data that can be gathered from clinicians. Now, not all data is going to be gathered from clinicians. In epidemiological studies where data is self-reported by the participant or an ill individual or gathered from existing records, such as in a large population-based survey, then the clinical practitioner might not actually be involved. Okay? Now, we do have this close working connection between clinical medicine and epidemiology, but there are some differences. So if the focus of clinical medicine is going to be on individual patients, then what is going to be the focus of epidemiology? Well, the focus of epidemiology is going to be on population-based medicine or prevention and control of diseases in a population and not a single patient one at a time. Now, while the clinician may ask what is wrong with a patient, okay, in order to make a diagnosis and a treatment, okay, the epidemiologist is actually going to ask what are the leading causes of death or disability in a specific population. In other words, what are the risk factors or the similar characteristics that we can identify that then can be uh, modified to reduce the risk of a disease in a population. And there you see that difference as well, whereas clinical medicine is interested in what is the appropriate treatment of the individual, then epidemiology, like I said, asks what can be done to reduce or prevent disease or risk factors. And finally, we're left with the question of who is involved. So while the clinician works primarily with the allied health team, including laboratory scientists, radiology technicians, pharmacists, and so forth, the epidemiologist works with the team as, as with that team as well to gather data, but they're also going to work with statisticians, medical anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and so on and so forth to not only gather data on risk factors and determinants, but to determine how these determinants can be better understood and ultimately modified to reduce the risk of disease and disability in the population. So epidemiology is it's a data-hungry science. We love data, okay? So since we're dealing with populations, then we're going to need a large amount of data to help us determine the distribution and determinants of a disease in a population. 
So because of this, we're left with the question, how do we approach the gathering of epidemiological data? Well, there are two main approaches that we're going to talk about now. There's descriptive epidemiology, which I've already mentioned really quick briefly in the beginning. Remember, that's person, place, and time. And then there is analytical epidemiology, which is going to deal with host, agent, and environment. Now, I want to point out that typically descriptive studies are done first. And the reason for that is they include the person, the place, and the time element that we discussed earlier. So I want you to think of descriptive epidemiology as telling a story. And it's telling the story of what is happening with a disease in a specific population. And then analytical epidemiology, which is essentially the second stage in how we approach epidemiology, is going to be determining what the story means. What is the underlying message from the story and how can we apply that in our practice? So in other words, we go out, we gather data on person, place, and time. We understand the who, the where, the what of the disease and the population. And then with analytical epidemiology, we can come back and we can analyze what are the underlying determinants and the underlying risk factors that are causing this disease in the population so that we can develop an intervention? In other words, you need to tell the story before you can decide what the story means. Now, I want to mention that sometimes studies um, only do descriptive epidemiology, and there's a variety of reasons for that, such as cost. It's very expensive to do analytical epidemiology. could be personnel. It's, uh, you've got to have specific biostatisticians who have access uh, to computer programs like Stata and SPSS and so on and so forth, okay, in order to do uh, analytical epidemiology. Or it might simply be that the descriptive epidemiology didn't provide us enough data from which to develop a hypothesis. Okay. But ultimately, our goal should be that descriptive epidemiology leads on to analytical epidemiology, which in turn leads to interventions in the control of disease. So now let's talk about the differences between uh, descriptive and analytical epidemiology just a little bit more in depth. Now, as I mentioned already, descriptive epidemiology is going to tell the story of a disease state in the population, and it's going to do that from the standpoint of person, place, and time. Now, the purpose here is to identify the specifics of the problem. And once we know how significant the problem is, we can use that uh, information to plan for and provide health services. So let's give an example. If we, through descriptive epidemiology, a person, place, and time, determine that 45% of the males between the ages of 25 and 35 in one of the jurisdictions of the US API is obese, this would suggest the need to prepare to provide services for what? For cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes in the coming, dec in the coming decades among this population. But at the same time, it indicates the need for further study to determine the, risk for, the risks for and the determinants of obesity as a means of planning interventions by the public health agency. So you can see here's another wonderful example of how public health and clinical services can both um, a benefit or gain from epidemiological data. So that brings us to analytical epidemiology. Now, analytical epidemiology studies the association between risk factors and a disease to determine why disease rates are high in a particular population. Now, we can also do the opposite. We can actually also study why disease rates are low in a particular group so that we can apply those findings to the rest of the population. So we know out here in the Pacific, when we look at certain diseases, that certain ethnic groups are lower, or excuse me, certain disease rates rates are lower in certain ethnic groups. Okay, So we want to know why certain ethnic groups have low rates of certain diseases so that we can then take what we know about that population and we can spread it to other populations as well. Let's look at an example of this really quick. Okay, So for example, we can study whether smoking 20 or more cigarettes per day increases the relative risk of type 2 diabetes in adults. Once we know this information, we can begin to plan interventions based upon the risk factor. So in other words, getting adults to reduce or to cease the use of tobacco as a means of reducing risk enhances the rates of type 2 diabetes in the population.
Now, analytical epidemiology uses the elements of host, agent, and environment to explore the risk factors and determinants of the disease in the same way that descriptive epidemiology is going to use person, place, and time. We're not going to get into host, agent, and environment today. That's a very in-depth discussion. Suffice it to say, you understand that analytical epidemiology allows us to test our hypothesis and determine the risk factors and to determine the social determinants of a disease that we, so that we can develop interventions. So now that you understand the difference between descriptive and analytical epidemiology, and you understand that descriptive is essentially telling the story of the disease and the population from person, place, and time, and then analytical epidemiology is uh, telling what the story means, and in particular what it means in terms of what risk factors are causing a disease. Now we can talk a little bit more about the specific functions of epidemiology, and in particular how these functions influence public health. So what are some of the functions of epidemiology, or in other words, what is the role of an epidemiologist? Now, there are seven core functions that we're going to talk about, and they include public health surveillance, investigations, data analysis, interventions, evaluation of programs, communication, and that would be like communication during and before times of crisis, as well as communication during non-crisis events as well, and then the final one, would be management and teamwork. Now it's important to remember that many of these functions occur at the same time, such as management and teamwork as part of surveillance systems or outbreak response. And in the coming slides we'll discuss these functions one at a time. So public health surveillance is going to be the first core function that we'll talk about. So how do we define surveillance? Okay, well here we see an example and we see here the prevalence of smoking in the United States over a period of time from 1990 to 2010. All right, so it shows us that essentially we see the prevalence of smoking went down during that period of time. But surveillance is more than this. It's more than just tracking disease rates in a population. And what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit more in depth in what we mean with surveillance on the next slide. So here we see the CDC definition of public health surveillance. And as you can see there, it's defined as the ongoing systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of health-related data essential to the planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health process practice closely integrated with the timely dissemination of these data to those responsible for prevention and control. Okay? Kind of a convoluted thing there. Let's break it down. Simply put, this means it is a process whereby we systematically, or through systems that are already in place, processes that are already in place, gather information from a wide variety of sources such that we understand the current state of a disease in the population we serve. So in other words, the person, the place, and the time. And once we understand that, we can better identify critical trends before they occur and before they become problematic, and then we can implement preventative measures more quickly. Now, without data, think about this. Without data, we in public health are blind in terms of determining what diseases are out there, how much of a disease is out there, and what population is impacted by that disease. Surveillance through epidemiology gives us our eyes and our ears in the population so that we have that information on person, place, and time, and we have it in a timely manner that allows us to intervene before we go from having endemic disease rates to having epidemic disease rates. So if surveillance is a core function, so is investigation. Now investigation, like I said, is going to be a core function of epidemiologists. And this is oftentimes called field epidemiology or field investigations. Now from my standpoint, as um, originally having been trained as an infectious disease epidemiologist and as a social epidemiologist, this is the fun stuff. Okay. Now we usually think about investigations in terms of going out into the field when we have an infectious disease out. Break, all right, such as dengue or Zika virus or a typhoid or cholera or something like that. Okay, but investigation is also going to be critical to non-communicable disease epidemiology as well. So, what would be an example 
of NCD investigations? Well, consider, for example, a survey of adults to ask about physical activity during the week and barriers to physical activity. All right, This would require fieldwork and is thus considered part of an NCD epidemiology investigation. Mm -hmm. So NCD epidemiology involves investigations. It also is going to involve data analysis. Now, gathering data in the field by person, place, and time, remember that's descriptive epidemiology, is exciting. And it really is. You get to go out, you get to meet people, you get to do fun things. But the real work is done in analyzing what that data means using analytical epidemiology of host agent and environment. Now, data analysis involves describing the distribution of a disease or a health state in a population, and from that distribution or description, creating a hypothesis about what causes or protects against the health state. So in doing, epidemiologists can actually identify determinants of a disease and how they are related to risk factors using statistical methodologies. Epidemiologists then interpret what these associations mean for the prevention and control of diseases such as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and so forth in a population. And data analysis is absolutely critical. If we can't make sense of the data, then once again, we're kind of blind in the dark in terms of the disease rates as well as their determinants in the population. So epidemiologists are also going to be involved in interventions. Now I want to point out that there was actually a time when epidemiology was seen as a hard science, okay? And hence it only was only involved in gathering and analyzing informa uh, information while interventions were left to other members of the public health team. Okay. Those days are over. There's a new generation of epidemiologists who are now heavily involved in designing and assessing the effectiveness of the interventions. Epidemiology, I want to point out, is also important for planning and evaluating whether interventions have been effective. And we'll actually talk about that just a minute in terms of uh, process versus outcome evaluation. So in other words, asking the questions like, is the intervention functioning as it was intended to do? intended to, and is the intervention actually resulting in a change in behavior and hence lower rates of a disease. I also want to mention that epidemiology is used in the design and implementation of interventions. And how is that done? Well, it's done by describing the patterns of the disease. So in other words, providing the who, the where, and the when on which an intervention can actually be based. Now, I mentioned briefly just a second ago that epidemiology is involved in evaluation, and it's specifically going to be involved in two different types of evaluation. These are going to include process evaluation as well as outcome evaluation. Now, process evaluations deal with the actual operations of a project. It answers a question of whether the program or the intervention is operating as it was intended. So, for example, does the target audience have access to the intervention as intended? So, in other words, if we have an intervention that's supposed to go into the school system, is the intervention actually getting into the school system? And are the students who are the target audience actually getting access to that intervention? Or it could ask the question, are the health promotion materials translated correctly into the local language? Okay, So I want you to notice when it comes to process evaluation in those examples that I just gave, notice that these questions do not deal with whether the intervention is effective. That is not the function of a process evaluation. That's going to be the function of an outcome evaluation. Okay, so outcome evaluation assesses change in health in the target population. So it's going to answer questions such as, are fewer people getting the disease because of the intervention? Or are people altering their behavior because of the intervention? So epidemiology gather, gathers the data to um, determine both process as well as outcome questions. And they are both important. All right, in terms of determining whether or not a program is doing what it was intended to do. Now, communication is going to be another critical skill of the epidemiologist. Okay, so how do we communicate in epidemiology and to whom do we communicate? Now, communication involves communicating our findings to target populations. So, in other words, if we know a risk factor for 
uh, lung cancer is cigarette smoking, how do we communicate that to at-risk groups? In other words, people who are smoking cigarettes. Okay, And it also involves communicating to groups during times of crisis. So in other words, during times of outbreaks. So we usually think about that in terms of infectious disease outbreaks. But as you probably know, most of the country health directors and organizations like PHOA and SPC have actually declared an NCD-related state of emergency here in the Pacific. So we are in an emergency situation regarding um, NCDs. So how do we communicate information about the prevention of NCDs to populations that we serve? That's part of communication, okay? We also need to communicate our findings to other public health providers so that they can take timely action. And important also that we be able to communicate our findings to policymakers, the individuals that determine how the money is spent, what programs are supported, and so on and so forth, or the individuals that make laws regarding policies, such as Koshrai. You know, way to go, Koshrai. Koshrai passed a law that prohibited the use of e-cigarettes. That's something that really hasn't even been looked at on the mainland in the United States, but presumably it was the communication of epidemiological data about the risks of e-cigarettes to the lawmakers in Koshrai and to the public health practitioners in Koshrai so that those laws could be put into effect. So communication is a very important function of the epidemiologist. Okay, so that brings us to our last function, or management and teamwork. And the good news is we've only got about six more slides to go after this. And in fact, the remaining slides are going to be our review. So we're almost there. Thanks for sticking with me. Well, management and teamwork are going to be critical skills. Um, epidemiologists don't work in a bubble. We don't work in a vacuum. We work as part of a public health team that includes the community. In other words, the audience that we serve. Okay. Epidemiologists have to work in many different groups. They have to work with public health officials. They have to work with laboratory scientists. They have to work with the community that we serve and the many different um, subsets of the community, the different ethnic groups, the different economic groups that we work with in the community. Okay. They also have to work with environmental health specialists like sanitarians. They work with clinical staff, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and so on and so forth. And they work with other people like community health workers that are out there on the front line. So without the ability to do decent amounts of uh, management and teamwork, then it doesn't matter how good an epidemiologist is at, at the science. If he can't work with a team, then he can't be effective in preventing diseases in the population. Wow, we made it to the review. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask a series of questions. Well, you're not in class with me, so I can't ask you specifically. But as I ask the questions, here's what I want from you. Please think about how these questions apply to you in your work environment, on your island, in your agency, in your clinic, okay? And as you think about these, and as you go about thinking about how to answer these questions, remember that in order to get credit for this presentation, I'm going to ask you to tell me three things that you learned and how they relate to your job. So this is a good opportunity to start thinking about that. So here are our first two review questions. So you can see the first one is name at least four types of NCDs. And then the second one is name at least four characteristics of NCDs. Now in the interest of time, okay, and in not making this longer than it needs to be, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead and give you the answers. Okay, but what you can do is if you're watching this video, what I'd like you to do is pause right here and note the four different types of NCDs that you can think of. Note the four different characteristics of NCDs that you think of. And in particular, think about how they relate to the populations that you serve. So I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead now, so now's your chance to pause. So name at least four types of NCDs. Well, we've got cardiovascular disease, okay? We've got cancer, we've got diabetes, and in particular, type 2 diabetes. I want to point that out. I think we're getting away from using type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 2 is the behavioral-based one, okay? Um, there's a genetic component to it as well, but it's largely uh, behavioral. Um, chronic lung disease, chronic neurological disorders, arthritis, as well as musculoskeletal disorders. And then our second question was, name at least four characteristics of NCDs. Well, very complex etiology, multiple risk factors, long latency period, non-contagious in their origin, prolonged course of illness, and they result in functional impairment or disability, and of course, they're not curable.
All right, so here's our second set of review questions. Okay, so what are at least three examples of modifiable risk factors, and what are at least three examples of non modifiable risk factors? All right, so I'm going to go ahead, but you pause and write down your answers. So our modifiable risk factors are things based in lifestyle or behavioral, such as alcohol use, smoking, poor diet, uh, physical inactivity, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, um, high blood glucose, and so on and so forth. And then the second question we asked was, what are at least three examples of non-modifiable risk factors? And that would be things like age, can't change your age, can't change your race, can't really change your genetics, your family history, and so on and so forth. Well, there you have it. We made it. We've made it to the very first lecture in the uh, Certificate of Professional Practice in the Epidemiology and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases. So what do you need to do now to get credit for this lecture? Because remember, there's 10 lectures, one per month. We'll finish in November. So what is it you need to do to get credit for this lecture towards er earning your very own Certificate of Professional Practice? Well, send me an email. Okay, you can see my emails right there, brian.mangum at fnu.ac.fj. In that email, obviously, tell me your name. Tell me where you're located. Tell me what your job title is. And the most important thing is tell me three things you learned from this lecture that you can apply in your job setting. Okay, keep it simple. You know, a sentence or two for each of the three things is all I require. I just want you to demonstrate that you learned something. And then once I receive this information from you, what I'll do is I'll record your participation. And then, voila, you're ready for the next video lecture, which will be entitled Overview of NCDs and Related Risk Factors. And that's going to be released next month. Well, I just want to say thank you for your participation. Um, Without your willingness to work hard every day and to take time away from your important job duties to improve your skills through classes such as this, then there couldn't be public health in the Pacific, all right? There couldn't be the ongoing education of the public health workforce that makes it better and easier for you to control things like NCDs. So I want to say thank you to you. Well done and keep up the hard work. And I hope you're excited. I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope you're looking forward to our next lecture, which will be released via video next month.